Hello, Bill Share. Good morning, Matt K. Lewis. Welcome to the DMZ, everybody. Uh, a special Pope Francis episode. I am taping from uh, an undisclosed location so as not to have to enter into the District of Columbia, uh, where things, a lot of road closures today. It'll be, it'll be quite interesting. So uh, I, is, is, so the federal government's are they in like uh, a quasi shutdown, like employees stay at home or work from home or don't work at all? Oh, great question. I have no idea, um, but I would assume so. It's, uh, I mean, um, I heard on uh, WTOP, our, our Washington, D.C. news, uh, radio news channel, that this is being treated by the government uh, or Homeland Security, I think, the way that they would treat a Super Bowl or an inauguration. So this is a big, big deal. Uh, there are people, I'm told, there are people who were essentially sleeping in the streets, on the sidewalks, uh, waiting for uh, just maybe to touch a hem of his garment, so to speak, uh, to, to catch a glimpse of the pontiff. So, uh, and, you know, my office is is a couple blocks from the White House where President Obama and Pope Francis are uh, as we tape this. Um, so... Yeah, I, I, I opted to uh, to uh, work from the satellite office today. <laughs> but it's not an edict from, from Tucker that you should not come in. It's just your choice whether to work from home or not. Um, the Daily Caller is such a cool place that it's essentially always your choice whether to work from <laughs> home or not. I mean, people don't believe, like, I, I, I don't know that I can ever work anywhere else because it's such a fun and like relaxed place to work. And, and, and he basically runs it the way a real libertarian would view, would, <laughs> would run things like uh, a la very laissez faire, very like, if, if you're good, you'll get, you know, kind of, you know, you're an adult, do what you want to do, essentially. Well, this seems um, very, it seems very uncapitalist, though, perhaps libertarian, but not exactly. Well, but, I would, uh, I, but I'm for what works. For I think profits in mind. But yeah, but I think it works. I mean, I'm for what works, and I think that it works. I think that he gets that, um, you know, that that he actually gets more production and uh, and and longer uh, tenure out of people who love their job than if uh, if he sort of cracked the whip and forced you to check in and uh, sign out when you go to the bathroom <laughs> and uh, all the stuff that that we've heard from some media outlets uh, do. So well, come work uh, at the Daily it, Caller uh, if you're out there and you want a job. I highly recommend it. <laughs> By the um, way, I'm drinking from my Javelin cup. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm home, so I, I, I don't have a paper cup. This is my, uh, my, my book agents. So check them out, too. Lots of plug. So do you, what, what's on your mind first? I mean, I mean, obviously the Pope's big, but the Scott Walker flame out's huge, too. Uh, I, I don't know yeah. where to start. Well, let's start with Scott Walker. I know there was another dialogue who kind of beat us to the punch uh, on this one. They must have been taping uh, uh, their schedule. Uh, must have sort of been. On I think the... you mean there was there was a warm up act before you and I you know delivered yeah. the final the the final blow to the Scott Walker campaign. Yeah, let's think of that as foreplay, and this will be uh, this will be where the action is. Um, I just want to say I think I had this. Not that I predicted that Scott Walker would drop out, because I'm actually surprised that anybody's dropping out, to be honest with you. Um, but I think I was, and I'm sure we talked about it here, I'm, I've argued the entire time that Scott Walker was overrated and was not ready for prime time. Um, I think I probably said it here uh, that, that it was uh, sort of a disaster waiting to happen. It just happened, even it, it manifested even quicker than I thought it would. No, I, I I think you were there before me, because uh, you were always down on his lack of charisma, and yes, I'm one I'm to on believe that uh, <clears throat> uh, other non-charismatic people have won nominations and become president before. So uh, that wasn't enough to knock me off. However, I, I will quote myself from my my May piece in Politico, where I where I went all in on Hillary versus Jeb. I'm sticking with that. Okay. Uh, well, uh, you might want to quit reminding people of that because it ain't going to happen. All um, in. All in. <laughs> all in for week one. That's what RG3 <laughs> said. Uh, not always a good idea. Uh, well, if we're quoting well, so ourselves. By, by, I said about Walker then, um, 
when I talked to him up in February, he was fresh off his strong performance in one of the first Iowa catacalls, and even today he holds a precarious first place position in Iowa polls. But his quick rise was blunted by a series of wobbly moments, saying he was ready for ISIS because he fought unions and inelegantly dodging a question about evolution and redefined the meaning of flip-flop to exempt any utterance by a non-legislature. In a vacuum, each individual gaffe is not fatal, but when you are trying to scrounge up enough cash to avoid being drowned by the Bush machine, such mistakes keep donors from betting it all on you. I'm not being theoretical. The cookbars have signaled that Walker is their personal favorite, yet their plans have spread their money around several candidates. And now we did learn, in fact, the reason why he pulled the plug was that the money was not there. He had super PAC money. Uh, you, you, can give, you can have a handful of you know union-hating corporate titans give to your super PAC, but it's your actual campaign that pays the staff and has the offices and funds the air travel and that fundraising wasn't happening yeah. at all. That you, you need broader right, base support for that. No, you're right. But I would say, and this is a mistake that I think Perry and Walker both made. You're right, but it doesn't have to be that way. So, in other words, it is entirely possible that a super PAC could fund almost everything. Now, it it, it would have. So, in other words, you couldn't coordinate, but you could theoretically. Have your best friend and campaign manager run the super PAC. The super PAC could employ um, all of the, let's say, grassroots staff, right? They, they could employ, the super PAC could from day one run the Iowa turnout operation and fund it if that's how you set it up initially. And then, yes, the candidate would have to raise money for the campaign to fly him or her around. Uh, but I guess what my, my point here is that while, while all the things you say are true, it would be very possible to minimize the expenses that legally have to be paid by a campaign and maximize the expenses that could be paid for by a super PAC. Um, you would have to have somebody running that super PAC that you Im- implicitly trusted uh, and, and you could not coordinate with them unless you did it through the media. You know, just but but it's possible. And I think if Perry and or Walker had set up their super PAC differently from the get go, they could both still be in the race today financially, because all you have to do is live off the land. You could scrape by like John McCain in the summer of 2007 going, you know, carrying your own bags at airports. I mean, you know, it doesn't take that much money if you've structured it this way. That's my understanding, at least, Bill. Am I wrong? Well, well, why didn't. Walker, I mean, you know, John McCain's a great example. It's 2007. Uh, we everyone's assuming Rudy Giuliani is going to get the nomination. Uh, McCain is is not living up to expectations. He's got a bloated campaign staff. He does a staff massacre, lays a whole bunch of people. You know, yeah. uh, deals with these warring factions in his campaign outfit. You know, eliminates a faction, and then hunkers down and doesn't break out big until the winter. Um, when he then catapults himself into uh, into contention again, why wouldn't Walker uh, just say, "Look, there's no way the nominee is Trump, Fiorina, or Carson. These people will flame out. I just need to hunker down and wait that stuff out and yeah. break out big later on." Why? What? Why? Why do you think he didn't see a light at the end of the tunnel? That's a good question. Uh, I have a few theories. Um, I mean, one theory would be John McCain lost the general election. And you could argue that if you're going to be competitive against Hillary Clinton, you need to have an infrastructure. You need to be a behemoth and um, sort of limping across the finish line uh, as the nominee doesn't do you much good. Um, You need to have the infrastructure in place. I don't think that's what Walker was arguing, but I could that is that is an interesting point. I think that, that you need to be able you don't back into the playoffs. You need to go go big or go home. I think wasn't Scott Walker's like, didn't he go around talking about go big? Uh, so, so it's sort of indicative of, of the mentality. They made a calculated effort, uh, a calculated decision early on to go big um, and to really ramp up and, and to create this huge infrastructure to hire all of these people. Apparently, um, the campaign manager Wiley presented a, a plan B option, which would be a scaled down campaign, which would still result or would still require spending a million dollars a month. I don't know. How that's the scaled down campaign, that, <laughs> but that that was apparently Walker had like two options: keep going as you're going, which is um, impossible mathematically, or do, go for a scaled down campaign, which would still cost you a million dollars a month, 
which also turned out to be impossible. I don't know why there wasn't an option C, fire everybody. Um, it seems like Walker's wife, Tanette, uh, called this meeting and uh, played a Democrat. major role in it. Yeah, the one who uh, seems a little squishy to me. Um, look, remember how Walker was always going around using the royal we? Like, we're committed to winning our campaign. You know, he would never say my campaign or I. Maybe it's she. Maybe that was what he meant to say. You know, not we, but she. Maybe she actually, you know, was saying, like, let's face reality, man. This ain't going to happen for you. Uh, pull the plug. Um, I don't know how a campaign gets to this, gets to the point where, like, they have to do that. I don't know why he couldn't have scaled it down uh, and just sort of stayed alive to see if he got a second bite at the apple. I mean, again, the, Tem the Temple Inti model is a prime example of a guy who, had he been allowed to stick around, he might have gotten a second look. I think part of this is that, I mean, all, theoretically all true. One of the nominees is not going to be who's the front runner today. It's, it's, it's not going to be Trump or Fiorina. I, can, I guarantee you that. I don't um, guarantee that, but I think you're, <laughs> I, I think 75%, you're, you're, you're likely 70. I think there's a 25% chance that it might be uh, Trump or Fiorina. Fair enough. Uh, but I, I think Walker's fundamental problem, and I, and I wrote about this, uh, on the ourfuture.org site, the Campaign of America's Future, uh, this morning. Uh, you know, he never got beyond the union bashing. Like, that was it. Like, that was his thing. And, and look, it's fine to have a thing. You, know, you, need some, you need something to distinguish yourself and to break in. And the first big splash he made in the campaign back in January was that speech to the Iowa Freedom Summit where he told the story of how a, he, he dealt with all of these uh, – uh, uh, angry harassment emails and such, you know, threats to his family. Uh, and uh, then that showed how he could stand up to anybody. Uh, people, he, he told that story well. He was good at telling that story. Uh, but it didn't occur to him you then have to do something else after that. You can't just bring everything back. You you, you can't bring ISIS back to unions. You can't bring, uh, you, you can't make your big policy idea, I'm, I'm going to eliminate the National Labor Relations Board and eliminate all federal worker unions. Uh, just none of that. None of people care about it. I mean, I, I get that it's it's a, a nice boogeyman for hardcore conservative activists, but most people in their day to day lives just don't interact with unions. Very few people are, are in a union. <laughs> yeah, and unions are also just diminishing, uh, obviously. But look, okay, so here's what I think happened. I'll give you my just really quick thumbnail of what I think happened to Walker. I think that um, first of all, he. He went from being like the county executive to five years later running for president. But what did he do in the middle? Well, in the middle of that, he had to take on the labor unions and win three elections in four years. So I don't see how you have the time to uh, intellectually grow while, you know, in other words, is, is the guy who ran for president that different than the guy who was five years ago a county executive? Not really. You don't have time to learn new stuff about foreign policy or economics or whatever, uh, when you're the governor of a state, when you're taking on the labor unions, uh, and when you are uh, r having to win three elections in four years and then run for president. So I just don't think he had the time intellectually to be ready for prime time, uh, to get up to speed on these big issues. And the same similar thing with Rick Perry. Um, you know, you have the, these governors who used to win well, Perry, the nomination. Well, Perry was governor for over a decade. I mean, well, I'm not if, saying if Perry didn't have time. But I'm saying, what is? Yeah, no, it's different in the sense that I think Perry would have had the time <laughs> to vote up on the issues had he had he done so. Um, but I think it's similar in the fact that they weren't ready. They were very ready to talk about Wisconsin and Texas, but not ready to talk about foreign policy, monetary policy, or, or whatever. Um, and, and, and nowadays, I think that's a benefit to people like Donald Trump, who are in the public eye all the time uh, and know how to work the media, and or U.S. senators like Rubio, Cruz, uh, who, talk, who go on Sunday morning shows and have to talk about international relations, let's say, uh, every week. So you, you're suggesting that a first-term senator is more able – to handle the types of, of uh, the, the broad scope of questions you get as president than, than a one-term governor would. Is that that's what you're Absolutely. saying? Absolutely. Maybe more than a two-term governor would. 
Absolutely. Uh, I mean, that you know, foreign policy is always going to be the weak spot for any governor. You know, everyone always bashes senators. Uh, saying that they're, you know, they're, they're windbags. They haven't run anything. They don't know how to meet a payroll, that, that sort of stuff. Uh, but obviously they deal with foreign policy matters uh, to some degree more than a governor would. But yeah. uh, other other governors have become president. It has happened before. Yeah, uh, and it, but it, not only did it happen before, it used to be the pathway. I mean, for, for a long time, that was the ticket to be a governor. But I think that that the change, and, and, and this is, you know, oscillated throughout history, but but, you know, in, in recent years, I don't know, from like, you know, from what, the mid 70s to uh, to 2000 uh, to do, you know, through through George W. Bush, I mean, from Jimmy Carter to George W. Bush, being a governor was like the way to go. Is it a coincidence that it seems to have changed in the era when we have 24 hour cable news and, and media explosion? I mean, I, I don't think it's just that. I mean, I mean, uh, you know, Walker was not only thin on foreign policy, he was also thin on domestic policy. He was thin across the board. And this is after going through this publicly humiliating cram session where he's <laughs> meeting all these, you know, uh, elder uh, elder states people and they're talking to the press about how they're teaching Walker this or that. And then he comes down the bay and he's still just as dumb as a brick as he was when he started the campaign. So uh, I well, think it's like I, I, a Walker. I think the other problem was the pandering. Um, so I think what happened was for some reason, you know, Walker really had this opportunity, I think, to be accepted by sort of conservative opinion and thought leaders and the Republican establishment and the grassroots. But rather than sort of capitalizing on being this hybrid candidate, he doubled down on being the, um, the populist, nativist, uh, grassroots Tea Party Iowa guy, and so I think the first so step one but, but was in the dumbest way possible. Let's build a Canadian wall. I mean that's well, that's, that's even dumber than what Trump is saying. <laughs> well, I think what happened is he ended up sort of being like Romney. He he was saying things he didn't necessarily believe, and it just it was very transparent that he was trying to be something he wasn't, and and it doesn't work when you do that. But I think so. So like step one was. He, he doubles down on being like the populist candidate. But then step two, so, so he burns the bridges with like the, the conservative opinion leaders, thought leaders, and the establishment. Step two then is he gets outflanked by the popul- uh, with the populist by Donald Trump. So I think Trump did hurt him. Um, it was a self-inflicted wound, but essentially he, he um, sold out everybody else, doubled down on being the candidate, the sort of anti-immigration candidate, only to be outflanked by Donald Trump on that. And I'll give you just one example of of, of the sort of what might have been. Um, Ann Coulter in March said that she hated everybody in the field except for Scott Walker. Um, two weeks ago, Ann Coulter introduced Donald Trump at a speech in Iowa. So... I'm not saying that that she would have been the end all be all of of Scott Walker's success, but one could imagine that he might have become the candidate of the Ann Coulters of the Breitbart's of the world. They may have coalesced around him and it could have been very different. And then Donald Trump comes in and steals his thunder. Having already well, alienated argument everybody argument about else. why it's going to be Jeb, that the conservatives are going to be incapable of consolidating around one candidate and stick with that candidate. They're going to keep jumping around as they did. Uh, the, the last several elections. It could happen. I think that, you know, Donald seems like maybe the air is starting to seep out and uh, and maybe Carly's the next um, the next big thing. And, and then we'll see maybe that lasts or maybe it only lasts until they start going after her record at HP, you know. Uh, I got to cut things a little short uh, today, so I don't want to keep Stan Walker too long. I, I, I'm sure that the Pope's visits on your mind, you, you, you write a lot about intersection of faith and politics. Uh, there's a lot of giddiness on the left because Pope Francis has been so uh, uh, progressive sounding on economics, on, on climate. Uh, uh, this might not be uh, as, as well known, but just this month, you know, he, the, he's declared mm-hmm. that it's going to be a, uh, a jubilee year uh, starting in December. And a jubilee year in the Catholic tradition is a year where 
uh, there's, there's an extra emphasis on being a, a, a absolved from sin, uh, and how that's implemented varies. Uh, when these jubilee years happen, so roughly every 20 years or so. Um, uh, and so uh, one of the things that the Pope has said for the jubilee year was that uh, uh, you're, if, if, if you had gotten an abortion, that will be uh, that sin will be uh, removed uh, in the in the, in the jubilee year. Uh, it's not the same as being pro-choice. But it's, it's sort of a de-emphasis, whereas you know, before you, you got excommunicated from the church, we got an abortion. Now he's saying that yeah, that could be uh, uh, that, that that sin can be washed away. Um, so uh, I'm particularly curious. Everyone's over expecting, you know, the Pope speaks to the Congress uh, tomorrow. We're taping on Wednesday. Uh, people are assuming he's going to do a lot on climate because they have the big climate encyclical in the summer. But with this Planned parent issue blowing up uh, in in the in the Congress. It, I, I got to think he's going to talk about it in some capacity. It, it could well be he's going to want to say something very uh, pro-life to take the edge off of his more uh, more leftist positions. But he also might say to the Congress, "Hey, look, just get get over this, right? Don't don't hurt don't hurt poor people by shutting down the government uh, for a feudal strategy that's not going to help the culture of life." I just don't know what he's going to do, but I, I, I got to think he's going to address it in some capacity. Uh, we'll see. We shall see. It's hard to imagine that he wouldn't. But, um, you know, apparently the reports out of Cuba is that he really avoided uh, talking about kind of hot button issues down there, which would be human rights violations and dissidents. So maybe he has the same tack here where he's going to just sort of um, uh, talk about things like forgiveness and, and charity and, and not go there. Um, I, I think um, a lot of conservatives would, would be, be disappointed. A lot of conservative Catholics, especially, would be disappointed if he uh, if he didn't talk about life. Um, that's going to be something to keep an eye on. Absolutely. Uh, so, do you think that? I mean, after I mean, the, the whole cultural life concept came from Pope John Paul. I mean, that was that was in an encyclical of his that Republicans took and ran with. Uh, they didn't talk about the death penalty, the war part of that encyclical so much, but obviously on uh, abortion and, uh, and euthanasia they did. Uh, and we've had a lot of talk on the right about how we can't let faith be removed from the public square. Um, the, the secular left wants, want, wants, to, wants to get rid of all religious voices. Um, does that make this visit more complicated for the right? Um, is it making it harder for them to just shrug off what he's saying about the climate and what he says about income inequality as well, the Pope's going out of his lane here. He's, he shouldn't be talking about this stuff. He just he should stick to stick to Scripture. Uh, does does okay. is it possible that for some uh, conservatives that they have to come around to what the Pope is saying and say, look, you know, the Pope's making some sense here. I need to rethink my beliefs on some of these subjects because of what the Pope says. Or can they maintain this uh, newly created firewall between faith and politics? Man, there's a lot there. I, I could talk about this for hours. Um, I, I, we don't have that much time. Um, I would say a few things. One, I would say um, I think that I think that it's a mistake for conservatives to attack or criticize Pope Francis. Um, I think it's a trap that that President Obama would love to co-opt Pope Francis and his one billion Catholics around the world. Um, and for conservatives who agree with Pope Francis on a lot of stuff, including cultural issues like the life issue we talked about, to be cast as opponents of his because they don't agree with him on certain things. Um, I also think that uh, it's good it's good for us to be challenged um, to to think about things. You know, um, we may not we may not agree that uh, that climate change uh, is the sort of issue that warrants uh, completely overhauling our economy. Um, but we probably ought to agree that we're, you know, stewards of the earth and, and that that's, uh, you know, that's not incompatible, I think. Um, we, um, we may believe that free markets work and that Free markets and capitalism lifts more people out of prosperity than any other uh, system known to man, economic system. But I think we also can agree that materialism and commercialism and greed are bad. So to me, uh, a lot of what 
Well, when people hear Pope Francis talking uh, and it sounds discordant and, and it, conservatives start to get worried, a lot of what he's saying, I have no problem with at all whatsoever. Um, I thought Marco Rubio, Rubio on special report uh, last night, um, I guess what that's Tuesday night, uh, on special report did a great job of talking about uh, Pope Francis in a very respectful manner and, and showing that he believes that that the pontiff uh, misunderstands certain things about free markets, but that's okay because um, you know when when the pope is speaking theologically, um, that's different than when he's speaking about political matters. So, um, I, I I think that conservatives really need to uh, to be very careful and and how we talk about this. Uh, the eyes of the world are on us, and frankly, I think that we should just be uh, very happy that. Um, that the most popular Christian in the world is, is here and it presents an opportunity for people of faith to talk about their faith. And um, you put aside like his position on global warming or uh, immigration, even um, a lot of what he's a lot of a lot of what he talks about is is very countercultural today and, and our secular society. So. Um, I see the glass. I see the coffee mug is half full, my friend, not half empty. Well, and, and you know, to your point about about climate and um, uh, the economy, it, it would seem like it's an opportunity for conservatives to you know get off of certain positions that have been detrimental, you know, climate science denial, and say, uh, you know, the Pope makes a really important point about stewardship of the earth and respecting God's creation. I disagree with the president about using big government to solve these issues, but we all can agree with what the Pope has to say in that, I mean, I mean Grant's not going to agree with every, every line of the encyclical because he gets pretty deep into some of the economic stuff. And he, even, even some of the left don't agree with some of, 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 of what he said in the encyclical. Uh, but uh, uh, but the, you can say we agree, generally speaking, that we need to find a solution to uh, do our utmost to protect God's, God's creation. You know, why, not, why not take that opportunity to pivot off of positions that are, are holding the party back. Um, yeah, I think that that in some cases would be appropriate and depend, you know, obviously depending on what your political views truly are on the issue. Um, but that would be an opportunity for some people. Otherwise, I just think that there, there's a way to talk about it um, that is respectful and not incompatible. Um, again, you know, uh, when people hear Pope Francis talking about say corporations being greedy or, or you know, uh, they may be defensive and take that as we need to nationalize, and socialize uh, corporations. Um, other people might hear that and say, yes, free markets are great, but greed is bad. And, um, and as an individual, uh, if I'm a business owner or, or corporate head, this is a spiritual reminder that I need to uh, be a good person. Like, who's that? That guy that was like bilking people uh, who bought this drug, this medication, and, and, and this, I don't know his name, but a hedge fund charging hedge fund like seven hundred dollars, seven hundred dollars a pill. I think we need to condemn that. I mean, that's just a horrible human being. No, I'm not saying that the government needs to uh, seize his property, um, but that is not certainly not being a good Christian. I would say, and if the Pope says that, then I, I think he's right. Uh, is there any downside for Democrats here in embracing the Pope so strongly because obviously they don't agree with Catholic teachings on social issues? Do you, do you see any risk there? Uh, I think the interesting thing will be um, I'm sure that there are secular liberals who are offended. Like this morning, President Obama, uh, I guess at the Rose Garden, you know, gave what almost amounts to a sermon, you know. Uh, I think he opens up by saying, like, uh, what, what a beautiful day the Lord has made or if something to that effect. I mean, uh, he obviously is a guy or his writers. Uh, somebody is, is obviously very familiar with the shibboleths uh, and, and, and the sort of the terminology of Christians. Um, and, you know, I think that President Bush similarly was able to... Um, to uh, shrewdly tap into Catholic verbiage, talking about uh, um, 
like you know, the uh, um, the culture of life. That that's the actual line, which is not something that evangelicals used to say. That that was something that was uh, a dog whistle, I guess, to Catholics. Um, can dog whistles be good and not and not evil? Um, that was a <laughs> that was a message to Catholics uh, using their terminology. And I think that that President Obama. Um, talking sort of like a preacher this morning. And I suspect I, 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 that there might be some people who, who, who would argue, like, why is a president of the United States, we have a separation of church and state, why is the president calling him the Holy Father, let's say, or, or say, saying this is a day the Lord has made? Um, so uh, maybe that exists. You know the left better than I do. What, uh, what say you, Bill? Well, I don't, I don't, th- I mean, one, again, not knowing exactly what the Pope is going to say, you know, he has made comments on abortion and gay marriage that are far more moderate than what other Catholic uh, and, um, uh, and and other more conservative Christian leaders have done in, in recent years. So uh, I would be surprised if he said something that would be outright uh, embarrassing or humiliating while staying next to Obama or, or, or speaking to Congress. But even still, I, you know, because... Uh, you know, the, you know, there, there, there obviously there are Christian liberals and Christian Democrats. Uh, there isn't the same intertwining uh, of faith and politics in the left as there is in some corners of the right. So it's a little easier for the left to pick and choose and say, we agree with the Pope on this. We don't agree with them on that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, just the, the mere fact that the Pope leans left on anything, you know, that's it's it's a classic case of beating expectations, you know, so the fact that he does that at all uh, yeah. gets the attention and I'll and allows the left to, you know, turn the tables and say, you guys keep talking about faith in the public square. Here's the here's the guy doing it. Now. Now's your time to put up or shut up. Right. Uh, well, President, I, Obama, I was, I was, say, President Obama today, uh, this morning, gave I thought what I heard was a great speech um, and it sounded like a sermon. And he talked about um he did talk about the environment. Uh, I think he did it in a, in a fairly non-controversial way. Um, but then he would talk about how, you know, we need to have uh, compassion for immigrants, which I agree with and think is biblical and, 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 uh, and, and refugees. And, and he just didn't say, and the unborn, he needed to say, and then, and the unborn, you know, um, that is, in other, in other words, what I'm saying is like, I agreed with it, with what everything president Obama said, except for that glaring omission. And, um, and so I think that uh, clearly, the, clearly President Obama is, is stressing uh, the, the areas where um, the things he believes in or his side believes in are compatible with what the well, what's, what's, what's interesting to me there is you know, Obama started his political journey uh, trying to bridge the gap between uh, liberalism and faith. Yeah. Um, you know, he, he was a churchgoer. Uh, he, his book, Audacity of Hope, came from a Jeremiah Wright sermon from years ago. He talked about that in the book. You know, he, uh, he, he t- t- talked about his faith uh, a lot on, on the trail. He, uh, uh, and he, he tried to, uh, you know, fuse uh, that language together and, 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 and uh, make the language of liberalism seem less off-putting to those uh, of faith. And all that has been highly obscured, you know, by the Jeremiah Wright controversy, by the attacks that Obama's a Muslim. Uh, and uh, it got to the point where, you know, Obama goes from church to time to time, but he never picked the church. There was a thought when he began his presidency, he would actually be a member of a congregation. And he never did that. Uh, he just sort of goes to different churches of, uh, at different, different, different times, uh, saying he doesn't want to be a, be a distraction. Uh, and he just still speaks at the, at the national prayer breakfast. So he, you do see him from time to time give speeches that show his ease talking about scripture, right. but they are more isolated examples and not say that that's a constant uh, in his presidency. And what has happened is that it hasn't mattered. He hasn't, he didn't actually need to do that. I mean, I think he has a, um, uh, I, I, if I remember my numbers correctly, he has he did better uh, with uh, with uh, churchgoers in 2008. The Democrats had in the past, but the 2012 numbers were actually fairly similar uh, to other elections, and he still won. Uh, he didn't he didn't have to make the same kind of inroads 
into church going uh, constituencies that he needed to, that other Democrats needed to in the past. Uh, so uh, it's notable that it's it's still on his mind, uh, and the fact that he does well, it here. Go and on, I think go it's on. fundamental. I think I mean, I, I I don't think it's fake. I mean, I think that that there that I think he is a Christian, and I think that this is where he wants to be. I think he's comfortable in this in this area. Um, I do think it's weird the way that our America's sort of political coalition shake out, though. I mean, you know, you could certainly imagine a scenario where. There's a party that looks like Pope Francis, you know, or, or a movement, a, a, a political ideology that looks like Pope Francis. That's, you know, environmental, environmentalist, pro-life, um, pro, uh, you know, sort of an, anti uh, uh, fat cat populist. I mean, you, you could imagine, uh, you know, that being the case. Um, for me personally, I could even if like let's say even if Donald Trump <laughs> were the nominee, um, I could never switch over to the other team because I just couldn't be in a party of infanticide. You know what I'm saying? So like that's a big deal breaker. But it is interesting that like if you were to take the abortion issue off the table, um, the you know the political. Uh, dichotomy could could rapidly change uh i got a few minutes left before i have to jump but i do want to get your we i know, I know we talked about shutdown and and uh the possibility of a boehner coup last week um but you know, you're 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 in the beltway you're in the conservative movement we are as of today uh like exactly one week before the shutdown deadline um uh, what what's 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 your what's your gauge? I mean, it, how serious is this that Boehner has no way out? Uh, I mean, the Senate the, the Senate is already on a track to pass a so called clean continuing resolution that would not defund Planned Parenthood, keep the government open for a couple months while they work out a longer term deal. Uh, where does that leave the House? Does the House not pass that bill? Does Boehner not even try? to pass that bill and so you have a shutdown or does Boehner try to uh, force the issue and get Democratic votes for that and risk a coup attempt? I mean, uh, it, it seems like we are only days away with a whole lot unsettled. Yeah, I, I was, uh, uh, you know, hates to toot my horn, but toot, toot. I was ahead of this one, ahead of the curve on this one, like a month ago, maybe. <laughs> I wrote a piece for uh, the Washington Post and I wrote a piece for the Daily Beast uh, that touched on this issue. Um, a friend of mine has a theory that uh, there is a chance that John Boehner steps down after the Pope addresses a joint session of Congress. Um, not predicting steps down that this, before a shutdown, a, pre a preemptive re resignation. Not predicting that this will happen, but it's not a crazy theory. Uh, he's a devout Catholic. Um, the Pope comes and addresses a joint session of Congress and uh, Boehner drops the mic and says, I'm out and goes out on a high note. And uh, is, is that the, is that a high note <laughs> going out on? <laughs> it is. Yeah, he, he's been the speaker. Uh, the Pope comes and addresses a joint session of Congress and he goes down on his own terms rather than being ousted, like, taken down. Every, everything is a mess. See ya. <laughs> Enjoy cleaning Good it luck, up. guys. Mic drop. Um, well, I don't think everything's a mess anyway, but look, that's a theory. Uh, I think it's 15% likely that it'll happen. Um, but no, I think he is in serious trouble. And I think that, uh, what I'm, you know, what my, uh, sources tell me is that one false move and they pounce. Now, he, now whether it, it takes, he maybe he's, he may survive it, but if he doesn't, if he doesn't go along with everything that that the conservatives want to do, including a government shutdown, then um, then they pull the trigger. Uh, let, let me correct you there. President Obama would be shutting down the government, not conservatives. We all we oh, all. Know I'm that. sorry, you're right. Uh, Technically um, speaking, but <laughs> and here's the thing too, and I you know I don't, I don't have to remind you of this, Bill, but perception is reality, and. Um, it doesn't matter really what the truth is. It's going to be perceived that Republicans are to blame. 
And I, I just, I hate to tell people that, but I think it's pretty clear that that will be the case. Now, it would only take uh, about 30 Republicans in the House right. to prevent uh, a bill to keep the government open from passing and to oust Boehner as Speaker. If, if, Dem if all Democrats did not, if there was a motion to vacate the Speaker, the Speakership, and all Democrats agreed yeah. to vacate the Speakership. And they got 25 votes against the Speaker in January. So, right. so all they, they need is so five more. Right. Five more to actually do it when it counts and not do it for fun. Right. Uh, so it's a little bit different to get to, to get a hard 30 than, than a soft 25. Uh, but uh, it, but it, basically, it's not a large faction of the party. Uh, I guess my question to you is, you know, outside of Congress, the, the conservatives you talk to, you know, what's the ratio of people that think Boehner has to go and the government should be shut down? Is it or is it reflective of the the house caucus most of them don't most of them want to keep baker but bader most of them want to keep the government open it's just a handful uh who are making things complicated no i think i think that that so you, are you asking me about sort of opinion of of conservatives or about members of congress i'm asking you outside of congress in in, in the okay. washington conservative community what's your rough estimate of where where where, where the feeling is Okay, well, I mean, I would say that like people, people in Washington work in politics, and 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 they're they're a different breed. So, um, so I don't think they matter as much actually as sort of around the country. And I would say that around the country, the vast majority of conservatives probably think Boehner should go. Um, and I think that you know, as I wrote, you know, a couple weeks a month, I don't know, however long ago. Like somebody has to pay. There, there's, you know, President Obama has done all these bad things and somebody needs to pay. And since we can't make Obama pay, the one guy we could take down and punish is Boehner. And, you know, someone has to be held accountable. <laughs> and I think that, that that's basically where people are at. Um, they've been told that the leaders are the problem that they just don't fight hard enough that that that's the problem you know, i happen to be at a at a birthday party here in western massachusetts for for a friend of mine uh and an old high school friend of his moved to virginia uh became very conservative and won local office uh you know like, like a like a city council type of type of office uh and and so he he came. He's like, you got to meet my friend. You get into a big argument with him about stuff, you know. Uh, so so I go talk to him, and uh, uh, and we start talking about about. Uh, I, I said, you know, what issues are 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 happening, you know, in your in your county, and uh, well, let me preface that. He said he said that he, uh, he really wanted Boehner to go. You know, he hated Boehner. Yep. He wanted to see. He, he wants to see the House fight hard on the Iran deal. He seemed to care more about the Iran deal than, than Planned Parenthood, but he, he thought they should hold the line on that. And then when I asked him about what issues are live in your in your town, he said, "We got to end the sequester because <laughs> <You know? laughs> they want more money for their city budget." Uh, so it just sort of struck me that there's there, there, there's a sort of intellectual inconsistency in what people expect. I mean, uh, totally, Bader it's is the a guy get, get, right now trying out of our social security. Uh... Right, right. Phenomenon. I mean, Bader's the one who would be uh, has the best chance of, of lifting the sequester and doing this deal. If the government stays open, you can't do that if you if the government shuts down. Uh yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's that's where we're at. I think uh, it's a wind on a low note. That's okay. <laughs> well, I, if, if anything, this is going to be an extremely interesting uh, yeah. next few days. Let um, me uh, may, let, let me let me. I just want to show you something uh my book oh I got the actual uh I, I i can see it i can see which way should i look i'm gonna look this way i the see the actual, book i see it is it not beautiful bill it's more uh, it, wow the, the uncorrected what a beautiful cover manuscript thank you um <laughs> it's really cool to see your book sort of um as a book and and to read it like it's a real book and uh so this is where we're at and you can you can pre-order this bad boy.
too dumb to fail. Well, again, uh, Scott Scott Walker was too dumb and he failed. So I yes. think that you, you're already uh, making uh, making change happen in the Republican Party. Uh, That's right. And uh, I am hopeful that by the time your book comes out in January, uh, more dumb candidates would have failed by then. Yeah. Uh, but if you want to go all the way and and to completely uh, purify the party from its dumbness, there's only one way to do it. And that's yeah. by by this book, and it's right as you here. can see here, folks. Uh, you know, many many pages worth worth the price. I think it's like twenty dollars on Amazon. It it dropped that's a that's lot. A bargain. I don't know how it. I don't know why it's dropping. It hasn't even been launched yet. Well, that's um, the demand. I feel sorry that's all for demand, the demand, right? I, I don't know what the deal is, um, but anyway, get go get the book, and uh, that's all I ask. I'm not asking for much here. <laughs> uh, I'm excited about the book. Uh, great to talk to you. I mean, maybe we should talk um, on a Thursday, October 1st. Maybe we should wait till after a shutdown deadline and see what uh, transpires. Uh, I, I'm, I'm up for anything, man. So uh, we'll just, you know, have your people call my people. <laughs> okay. And plus whatever, uh, uh, till whatever, next week. Corporate, whatever corporate blogging heads decides. Uh, until <laughs> next week, Bill Share. Uh, always good talking to you. Stay classy and uh, and uh, stay out of DC, people. Don't go in there this week. <laughs>